since our instructor got hit by a kryptonite on his way on over here. <laughs> anyway, so let's start off with the tutorials. This one is on D3JS and instructor Samir Segal is here. So, so I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, ah, that's fine. <laughs> so I'm really sorry for showing up half an hour later in my own session. Um, I woke up this morning, I slept really late last night working on this, woke up this morning, nothing was working. So I was just thinking about, you know, I mean, even if I come, what will I do? So at 10.40 was my last comment. Hopefully things are working. I don't know how to check. And um, I'm, I'm really, really sorry about this. I feel really embarrassed. But uh, anyway, let's just get yeah. started. You have the whole night to make up for it. So <laughs> <Cool. Yeah>. so <laughs> Alright, let's get started then. Okay, if you guys, um, I don't know if you guys uh, can access this here. Okay, did you guys look at this? Did you? So, so first, actually, just a quick sort of uh, show of hands. How many of you used D3 before? Uh, I don't know you use D3 a lot, but. <laughs> okay, and, um, and so, okay, and, and um, sorry, just again, sorry, how many of you used D3? And you guys are really comfortable and good at it? Yeah? Okay. No, so what I have over here is slightly more basic, uh, you know. I, ha I mean, we can start off with more basics and then more basic stuff. We can just quickly go through this uh, tutorial. And then, uh, then we can do something, whatever everyone wants to do. And we are, you can suggest something we can do. <laughs> okay, so if you can just open up this URL. I. I'm, le I'm learning Ember, so I tried to build something using Ember. And what I have is just uh, three sets of uh, sections. Um, you know, to me, D3, so, I mean, you guys are familiar with D3, right? That's why you all are here. But D3 has just, you know, a single, a simple thing that you can understand. If you can understand that and if you can master that, then life becomes really easy. So it basically segments data into, it, into three states. You know, enter, update, and exit state. And if you can understand what you want to do in each of these three states, so if you can understand what you want to do in each of these three states, then life becomes really easy and simple, right? So, um, and then so so D three is this, you know, um, it can pro it can take data in any format, right? It has connectors to read JSON, CSV, and all of that. But we'll just skip all of that because those things are there in the API references. We'll just sort of go directly to some of the things, if you know, the critical parts, if you can get that, then I think you can use the API reference and then become pretty uh, good at D3. Um, the way I use D3 is I just go into those gallery sections, see the chart that comes closest to my need, and then pick that, and then see what kind of data it needs, you know, how do you prep the data, and then sort of modify, push and pull, and edit and make it work, right? Um, there's a good section called, you know, and the resources section, if you can read that later, but there's something called about there's a philosophy on how you build reusable charts using D3. And that's interesting, and if you have time, maybe we can look into that. Anyway, um, so what I have over here is a very simple sort of sandbox sort of thing. Yeah, right? over here you have a code editor, and this is your data, you can add data to this. Um, right now, so right, you know, so this first section is just talking about philosophy of D3, you know, just talking about these three scales. So, this code over here does absolutely nothing. The, the div over here has, you know, an ID called graph. And if you run this code, it will just simply add an SVG element and G, which is a container. So, the way we, uh, you know, build uh, sort of graphs in D3 is we try and put everything into containers, these G containers, and that becomes really easy. You can translate it, you can transform them. So, you work on a group of elements together, right? And SVG is where um, you know we can put up all. It's like a container for you know adding SVGs. Anyway, um, you can just go ahead, click on Enter Data, and you can click you know Load, which will sort of add uh, some code to this. So this first section, what it does is just adds a container, right? This will be called once only internally once. I just try to keep it simple. Um, you know the sandbox will just call it once and. All it does is adds this G element to which we will add, you know, anything that we want to add later on. Now, if you look at your data, this is your data. So one, two, three, four is just an array, right? And if you go closer, what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to add circles. Okay. So this SVG element, this G element that is returned, we're using that. 
we're going to add circles, we're going to add data to this and you know in the interface we're going to append circles, specify center and radius, right? Um, so, you know the interesting part is just these three lines, right? So what you, you first over here you say select all circles, so if any circles exist already in the DOM in that SVG container, D3 will say recognize them first and then it will add data to them, right? And once it adds this array, it will very quickly get to know whether this is the data, this is new data that's going to be added to the DOM or not, right? And then only for those elements, it will then add the circles. So if you go here and click render graph, you would see sort of four circles, you know, come up, right? Um, it's doing nothing. I mean, all it's doing is that it's taking uh, this value 1, 2, 3, 4, multiplying it by 50 and put, specifying that as the, you know, X, Y coordinate and the radius. Is this simple? Is this too basic? Is this okay? Right? So this is just the first part where you are adding, you know, SVG elements, DOM elements to, um, you know, uh, you're adding SVG elements to the DOM, sorry. The next phase is exit, right? So what I'm going to do is, actually let me just go, go back to, let me just stay in this phase, let me add some more elements, 5, 6, 7, 8 and so on, right? And let me render my graph so I get more points, right? Now, I'm going to go to this exit data phase and I'm going to load this graph. Uh, I'm going to load this code and I'm going to say run, right? You see nothing happened because you haven't changed any of the data just yet, right? Now, let me go ahead and remove the fourth element over here, right? And let's click run, right? We click the fourth element Right? So maybe this should have become red, but this became red. Right? So this is pretty interesting because D3, the way we've just specified, if you go back to, um, yeah, so you go back to the code over here, data or exit, you know, which is filled red. D3 didn't understand that we removed the fourth element, right? It just saw that the array became shorter. So it assumed automatically that the last element got removed from this, right? So, by default, when you supply data to D3, if it's in an array format, it just works on positions, it works on the index, on indexes, right? So, we have to sort of tell it and make it understand, okay, what is the unique ID? Right? Maybe the value is unique or, you know, some other tag in your JSON object. Anyway, we'll come to that. Or, uh, I mean, I'm just very quickly showing you the update phase. If I go ahead and if I change this 6 and make it maybe 10, right? And if I click run, you would see that the data has moved, right? So it's sort of understanding where, e and if you see the first three elements, they haven't changed, right? So it's understanding, okay, these elements are in the same place. But all of them have become green, right? So that's another interesting thing, that if you look at the code over here, it says data. It doesn't say enter or exit, so by default it means it's in the update phase and it's still green. So every time D3 loops, right? It looks at the data and it always runs it through the update phase, right? Unless it's new, I mean, if it's entered new, it would go into the enter phase and if it's exited, it would go into the exit phase. But otherwise, it would just run through this, right? Now, let's go back and correct this issue, you know, where we removed some element in between, but we got this red spot over here, right? So, if you go ahead and look at this code, um, you seen, you can see over here that we've added a function called, you know, so earlier we used to just supply data as an array, right? And now we're supplying data as, with a function called d comma i. So d is the value and i is the index, right? So by default, you know, um, d3 treats it this way, where, you know, this is sort of the standard default behavior where it would, you know, look at each element in the data and unique, it would identify its uniqueness by its position, right? But if we now set this as D, right, and wait, let's go ahead and clear our graph. Let's render this again.
let's go ahead and remove uh, this fifth element. Okay. Goes well with the fifth element. So not correctly identifies it because we've sort of done it, you know, based on uh, the value. Right. Anyway, this seems simple, but this is this is the crux of D3. If you can sort of figure this out, then you know everything else is sort of APIs, and the more you use, the more you understand. So. The way you need to sort of, uh, when, when you are sort of trying to build a visualization, right? So one aspect is how your data is coming in, you know, preparing your data in the format, etc. And that, you know, maybe uh, next two speakers would cover in greater detail. But once your data comes in, then you need to start looking at it in this sort of model. That, you know, what is the new data? What is the data that's changing? And what's the data that's leaving this uh, visualization, right? And segment your graph into two parts. One is the setup of the graph, so where you set up axes, you set up, you know, maybe the labels or the title, and then something that will loop always, right? So that's how we've sort of done, you know, like we have a setup function and a drop function, right? Is this going okay? I'm sort of a little confused by the silence. Yeah, just clap if you like something. I mean, there's nothing really to be proud of here, but just. You know, just so that you can reassure me because I've come in half an hour late and we're slow on confidence already. Anyway, so um, in the previous sort of sections, right, we were we were just multiplying by 50 and translating the graph. There was no real scale, there was nothing. There was just you know, a simple displacement or the translation, right? What D3 has, D3 has some, uh, you know, great support for scales, right? Um, so it has... I mean, two large form sections are like linear and ordinal, but it also has a time scale. It has, um, and the time scale is actually pretty interesting. So when you're trying to do a time series visualization, it'll try and understand how your data is split up over time. So maybe it'll show Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Or if the data is over many months, it will show automatically Jan, Feb, you know, and so on and so forth. So this. So these uh, scales do a lot of heavy lifting for you. They have something called as ticks, and if you can specify, ticks are basically the number of, you know, um, what are those called? Basically, grid points, right, on a scale. And so if you specify five, it will give you five ticks, which evenly space out in the entire range that you have. Okay. Um, so, so this is how sort of a scale looks like, right? Where you say D three linear. Scale you know, scale, linear, range, you specify range. So the range, these would be typically your pixel values, you know. So what is the width of your graph? What is the height of your graph? And then you have something called as, it's a, and then you map the domain, right? So some, you remember the sets, so domain and range, right? So over here in the domain, we would put a value and we would get a pixel value out for that, right, from the range, right? That's, uh, that's the whole point of scale. And we're translating a, a numeric value <coughs> that our graph has into uh, a pixel value on the DOM, right? Now, d3.extend is a simple function for you to get the min-max, you know, values of your data. So if your data is not sorted, you know, it's all over the place, you just do d3.extend, and it'll automatically give you, uh, you know, so, like, just to take an example, let's say this is, so this is my data, right? And if I do a d3 dot extent of b, uh, yeah, so you get one comma fifty six. So it automatically gives you this, right? And so this this makes life very easy. So you can do it in one step, and it moves, you know, very easily. Um, supports bindings but when you use this you know editor called code mirror the whole thing gets messed up anyway, so if you see the data that we have over here one, two, three, four, and you get to see three bars right but r1 is basically over here you know which is at zero right because the mistake we made was we said extent where we said you know so it would have got one to four and it would have mapped that to 0 to 400, 
the one would have mapped to zero, which is right here, right, and four would have mapped to four hundred pixels, right. Now, if you see this, so what 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 we plotted over here is very simple. We have select all the rectangles, right, add the data, and in the interface, or append create new rectangles whose width are you know split by a factor of fifty, and we are specifying height. So over here we have specified y, right, which is our scale. And if you see over here, this is something really cool. I haven't supplied any argument. I just said y. Y is a function. So automatically, D3 takes each data element and passes it to that and gets the value and then adds that as the height. Right? If you want to see how this looks, so there you can see that. Right? So x x we were incrementing it by 50 and height is over here. So you know the first one is zero and the last one is 400. And width we were again specified as 30, right? That's it. So we specified the height. But you know we would have expected a graph which was the other way around, right? Normally that's how we look at bar charts. And this is this is how sort of again D3 draws because its origin is at this point, the leftmost left top corner, right? So when you want to draw a graph, you need to sort of reorient yourself and say, okay, um, I want to draw the graph, you know, this way. So basically what you would do is you would do the inverse. You would say, you know, this bar's height should have been actually should have been here from here to here, right? So you would translate your y and you would change the height to be the inverse, you know, maximum minus this value. So you could do that or or you could what you could do is you could reverse your your ranges, right? So earlier we would have sent one comma four, now we're saying four comma one. So now 4 marks to 0 and 1 marks to 400 pixels, right? And so you could use that and you could specify that for the y value, right? So now your graph, would, your, your bar would start lower and then the height would again be the max value, value to, you know, this. So let's just go ahead and try and render this. So now your graph sort of, you know, corrects itself, right? Um, so again, this is just, this is, I mean, this is a simple, you know, geometry. I mean, you need to just wrap your mind around that the origin is over there. Uh, so we've talked about linear scale. So linear scale is basically it's you know it's an f of x function. It will just draw a linear scale, right? Then there are something called as ordinal scales. So you know what we've been doing. Um, yeah, sorry. If you reload the page, seems to work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's, yeah, it's loading. Oh, it's loading the wrong section. Anyway, so let me try and sort of correct this here itself. So we want to create an ordinal scale, <coughs> right? Um, whose range bands are let's say between zero and four hundred. Okay, so again, so over here there's a slight difference. I won't just directly supply x, I'll supply x or y. Okay. So what we've done over here is we've created a new scale called ordinal. So you know linear scale is just right f of x. It's a function. It will have a linear mapping, right? And ordinal scale is typically sometimes when you have range values, right? So you don't wanna you wanna segment all your data into certain ranges, right? Or when you have uh, labels, like say 
you know, Monday to Sunday you have some data, but you want to show Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, right? So, so those are discrete uh, ranges. So that's when you would use an ordinal range. So what we've done over here is we've used ordinal scale solution. So we've said ordinal scale and we specified a range band, right? So over here we're saying it should spread between 0 and 400, um, you know, pixels on the x-axis side. And this is sort of to define what the, yeah, sorry, this was... Uh, so the data it's picking is the same data again? It's yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's the same for x, same for y? Same for x, same for y, yeah. Okay. So then the graph is fine, right? It's spread right. over. Right, oh, we could change that. Um, so, I mean, so actually, so x, we are, you know, we are supplying i, right? If you were supplying d, okay. if you were supplying d, then, you know, suppose your data looked like this, right? Um, you would have, it wouldn't, it would be messed up. Four would move to the right and one would come forward, right? Whereas we wanted to show it in, you know, so we want this value to be plotted first and then this value. So that's why we are supplying, you know, i which is position rather than D, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, this was the, the other thing that I put it down. Yeah, so, so now 4 is moved, right? 4 is the first part and so on and so forth. Okay, anyway, so I was explaining to you over here, right? So range bands are, right? So you, what you've done is you said 0 to 400 is what it should scale to on the x-axis. This point one is sort of uh, padding, right? That is, what is the space between bands that you want, right? If you if you don't have any uh, spacing, I think it, it assumes half to point five to begin with. But if you don't specify any, I mean, if you specify it, I think as one or zero, one of the two, it will completely collapse all the bars together. So you would have a, you know, you'll have all the bars sort of joined together, right? And this way. When you specify this padding, we can directly use this value called, you know, range band, right? Um, let's see if this is, x is not defined here. Okay. Just to show you guys what it looks like. Um, so this is... So this is, you know, this is the range band, so it's saying this is about 87 pixels wide, right? Um, let me see if I change this to 0.5 and then sort of see, so that becomes 44, if we make it 1, <coughs> it becomes 0, so it's, it's inverse, it's the, so that fraction, it's basically a fraction between saying that, you know, what is the padding is to, you know, the data, the bar of the width. Right, so padding is extra and the width of the bar, so it's a ratio between the two of them. So you're saying padding is 0.1% of the bar of it, right, or the total space. And if you make it 1, then padding takes the whole space and there's no space for the bar, that's why you get 0. Um, okay. So, so this is um, the same. Okay, now for the sections that broke in this morning. So, do you guys want to try using the sandbox and try and create uh, axes for this graph? You know, so, so the way the graph is right now, maybe you can add these two lines. But can you add an x and a y axis? Do you guys want to try that out? So, if there's a link here in this, you know, in adding axes. Um, you can open that up. You can look at um, how they so this is how you would add axes to the graph. You have this SVG element that's anyway coming to you. So you can add a class called axis, specify the width and height, add an append element, and then call this function axis. And the function axis you would define it you know, something like this, where you would say d3 dot svg axis scale x and you could specify tick values, right? And this function you would then take back and call it over here in this manner, then you would get an x axis. You guys want to try it out?
first step basically moves from the origin, it moves 0, 30. So the whole G element moves that way. So try it without the translate and see how your um, you know, graph looks like. And then add the translate and then see. So actually that was the next sort of topic for So this is how actually you know D3 sort of looks at a, a graph. So the origin is your top left corner, right? And then we we typically put everything into a G element and we translate the whole thing, you know, which is margin left comma top. So the whole graph moves this way. We do this because then you get spaces for space for your axes. Otherwise your axis labels would you know not be visible, right? And obviously if you're gonna add margin on all your sides, then your width of your graph has to be recalculated. So typically you would, these would be sort of the first few lines of your um, reusable chart. You would define sort of, def you know, um, default margins and then you would, you know, do something like this, right? You know, so like, you know, you guys are familiar with backbone and you can use extend and things like that. So, um, you know, basically you get back an options, you get a complete set of options and if, if user has specified some values, it will override and then you would do something like this, right, to translate your entire graph. Anyway, just coming back to the RCD. Um, so, yeah, so the I mean, you can do something like this, right? You specify <coughs> SP dot SVG access, right? And so this is so this is actually a helper function. We can draw an axis for you, and the axis would look like something like this, right? Where you have a line, and then you have at regular tick intervals you have labels that are already placed for you, right? The good part about this is that you know when you're starting off, this is really easy and you know, easy to do. The bad part about this is that this is not dynamic, right? So if your graph changes and the scale changes, right? Let's say, you know, um, you're getting whatever, pollution data, and in the evening suddenly there's a huge spike in pollution, right? So your scales change. So then, you know, your SV, this axis will not scale. So you would have to draw it by scratch. You would have to put a line and put tick values, etc. And we could come to that. But basically, you, so here we have this, we specified, we specified tick values, if we don't specify tick values, it would sort of decide on its own, right? And we put this 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, there's another function called ticks, so if you don't want to put tick values, you can specify ticks. Um, this is really good when you want to say, okay, I want only, you know, so many ticks or on my axes, right? Uh, otherwise, it, by default, I think it puts 10, but you can you know, change it to any number. It gets a little crowded sometimes. You want to lower that number. So over here, we've created an axis element, and then we go right to the bottom, and then we add this to our SVG element. We go right to the bottom because of the whole sort of z-index aspect, right? If we had put this up front, then this axis would have been behind the graph. Now, our access is just, I mean, everything is fine, but it's in the wrong place, right? 
um, and that sort of comes from your translate, uh, the question you were asking about translate. So right now we've just, we've translated <coughs> it into 0, 30, right? But 0, 30 is nowhere on our graph. Our, our graph has a maximum value, I mean, this bottom part of the graph is 400 pixels, right? So, I'm just going to go ahead. Yeah, so now we have a proper graph. CSS to sort of improve this. Um, right? You could either, you know, so you could, you can look at this. Uh, this is a path element, right? And class called domain. Right? So you could go ahead and style that and say, something like this so mm. yeah, you can always go and look at someone someone else's graph and sort of you know get this happening here but basically the, the other the interesting part is that you know you can split your styling between d3 and css right so in d3 you can just add a function uh, add a class and then go into your css and then sort of change the data over there and that that, that works really well because then you know you in d3 code you just focus on getting your graph up and ready and you know um, the heavy lifting and the styling can then just happen through css and these are all regular SVG elements and DOM elements, so we, you, know, you can apply a lot of things. Um, sorry. So, is this okay? Yeah. And yeah, so we, we already discussed this, that, um, you know, this yeah, is... Yeah, sorry. So, those functions, like, when you write that, uh, transform and translate. Yeah. Translate. Right. <coughs> so any hints on how to write that code better? Because, yeah, let's say you have some variables. You have to write translate, that string close, plus variable. Um, so that, so, I mean, this is JavaScript, right, at the end of the day. So if you're using copy script, you could use interpolation. If you're using underscore, you could use, you know, things like that. Sorry? No, so uh, your question is about that these would be parameters, right? So, I mean, how to write that code a bit more clearer? So, okay. Um, so, typically, what you would do is you would do this. You would, you know, in your setup function, you would get something like this, you know, the options along with the data, right? So, if I'm building a reusable component, I would do this. And then I would say, you know, in my these are my default options. Sorry, let's not call it. Let's call it default. Right? And so I would say, you know, this is my default width of 500 pixels. This is my default height. And so on and so forth, right? About margin, etc. Right? Then what I would do is, I'm going to 
not sure, but I think it's underscore which has this. Um, you would do this. So you would say options, comma, default options, right? And you would take those as your options. So what you've done now is that if the user forgets to specify something, you override, you, you know, you provide a default values. Then you would say, this is my width. You know, you would calculate your width as options dot width minus, um, you know, whatever things like margin dot left and all of that, right? And then you would use this function over here. Right? So however you write it now, oh, in JavaScript you could do this, right? Yeah, yeah, so, and yeah. so variable is fine. Variable is fine. So the time to write that function arguments and strings, isn't there some other way that you can call that element and say dot translate or um, See, I, I don't think so. I don't think so because uh, this is actually you're specifying this property. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. You're specifying this property here. You know, it's all it's almost equivalent to see this this yeah. translate. Right. Over here. This is almost equivalent to like doing document dot get element by id and then saying dot value equal to something. Right. So um, this is one way. But if you if you want to you know if you're using coffee script or something like that, then you know it becomes pretty easy. You could write something like this translate um, you know whatever offset. called interpolation in coffee script where I just directly supply it like this but when it runs it will actually make it this you know, because coffee script compiles into JavaScript or I mean you could use something like underscore and that might make it easier when it comes to templates. Does that help? Yeah. But uh, maybe you want to check that out and see sort of uh, how it works. Possible to not just express it as a string. Uh, yeah, JavaScript would help you to tell what errors are. Right, I mean, right. except it's a more complex function. Right. Right. No, I, I don't think so. I don't know. Do you have some idea? No, but I mean, what is the issue with uh, this? Oh, what is the issue that you see with this representation? Uh, I think so. I, think so. Right. Go ahead. Sure. No, I was just writing the same piece of code. Doesn't sound so neat that you write a string with arguments so plus plus x. I, I was trying to find something better, but I couldn't. So, uh, can you just yeah, no, so, uh, this happens for something like transform, where you can in the attribute specify complex parameters that you can say translate scale this that is that Usually, it doesn't happen for the other attributes anyway. I mean, if for instance you were to specify width and height and uh, x and y, then it's just putting in the parameters. Usually, only for transform this happens. That's the whole okay, time. Only for this. Yeah, and like Samir said, uh, between uh, copy script or underscore or template an option of doing it the other way. Now, uh, those are not necessarily faster to think. You yeah. could, for instance, use underscore or template, decompile the template and run it, but this is just blazing fast. So might be worth getting used to it. So this transform and translate are properties of uh, this uh, SVG like yeah. <coughs> Absolutely. Nothing to do so with So that doesn't have anything that you can pass g dot call some transform directly on the element or something? No, there isn't. But one possibility is uh, one could write a generic helper function uh, that creates a transformer. For example, suppose I create a function that takes a dictionary that says width colon something, or sorry, translate colon something, scale colon something, rotate colon something, and that function would return these values. Life becomes simpler. So yeah, in fact, why do you go here? <laughs> no, just trying. Yeah, something like this. You know, where you don't have to, you don't have to just write it once so that you don't have to. Zero comma width, right? Four hundred pixels, but it's it's got something else. Oh no, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Sorry, it's here. Yeah, oh, that's right. 
Um, anyway, so these are properties for the SVG and it takes this and it does its work. Um, okay. Anything else here? Okay. Just refresh my page. The, the next part was, you know, to just sort of, you know, it gets really boring to sort of see your data in static format, right? And the real power of D3 is that it gives you pretty uh, raw access, I mean, a pretty low level access to how you want to do visualization. I mean, have you ever worked with Google Visualization API and then you sort of realize this chart doesn't support this sort of functionality, right? It happens. I mean, whenever you use some sort of visualization API, there, there are certain, I mean, because it's an API, it has certain limitations, right? Whereas this is giving you raw control about each and everything, about how you want to design those elements, how you want to, how you want your labels to come, how you want to rotate and stuff like that. So you can combine different sort of animation and get your graph, you know, um, in uh, this thing. Okay, so let's look at this. see then that you know there was some animation right um, unfortunately we don't have a random maze let's just keep coming up and going down. Um, so what we're doing over here is so what we're doing over here is um, my code got slow So, how do we get that animation? It was very simple, right? In the interface, we specify, we've got our, um, you know, our basic rectangles. But when data changes, we have added two other things called transition, right? So, whatever comes after transition will be transitioned from its previous value to the new value, it will be a tween, right? And that, so like over here, I specified y. So, y will change, right? Y and height. Both of these parameters will change over this duration of 2000, right? Uh, D3 sort of adds some other uh, functions like interpolation and things like that. So you can specify your own custom animation. That's pretty cool. You can look at that. So it's basically a step function, you know, in that duration from, you know, previous value to old, uh, new value, how it should go, you could specify. So you could have an easing function. It could start really fast and then slow down. Or it could start slowly with a lot of inertia and then become really fast, right? Uh, so this kind of access it gives you and sort of capabilities which are not possible, you know, when you're working with standardized uh, visualization packages. Um, so, so now if you see this, right, this graph appears directly and then when I change the value, you know, then it sort of transforms, right? Um, this is no fun, right? You don't like to see data show up and then sort of behave differently, right? So, what, you know, one interesting thing that you can do is you can always specify, uh, oh wait, okay. So you can always specify, you know, an incorrect uh, starting value here, right? So in my interface, I'm forcing it to start off with an y, Actually, no, in this case, we want it to be 400, right? So. Right. You got the point, I mean, it <laughs> actually, we had to make the height also zero. So what do we do? We specified, you know, default values at the interface, right? And then we forced it to animate as soon as it loads it. Right. So now if you see this, now it comes out correctly. Right. So this is pretty, um, pretty straightforward. It's a simple trick, right, which you can apply. You provide it certain defaults and then force it to run through the update phase. So every time it does run an update phase, you know whether it's going through an enter phase or not, um, it does that. 
So this is, and you can add, you know, interpolation. You can. Um, I've only worked with standardized interpolation, but if you guys are familiar with Flash, etc., then you know you should find that pretty interesting. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Again, I'll have to. <coughs> so these are simple mouse events, right? So we are used to sort of using Google Visualization or some other API where you put your mouse over, you get a little tool tip. Right, you get some sort of indication. And if you, you look at some of the really cool graphs that people have built using D3, they use a lot of these masses and simple things, you know, like right now I'm just changing the color on hover. Right? I could go ahead and sort of add a label and say this is the value. I could add a tooltip and things like that. So these mouse events are very, very, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. You can just say on, you know, on mouse over for this particular element, fill it right, and then revert back. So I think the important part we all forget to is sometimes to revert back, right? So you end up with a visualization which looks slightly broken, but anyway, that's also fun sometimes. <laughs> um, so it's really simple, you have these few sets of events, mouse over, mouse out, right? And yeah, that makes life pretty easy. Now, the next thing actually, I don't have code for and that I run out of time, but I think you know, this I think is the, is like, uh, you know, when you're moving scales, right, so let me go ahead and sh let me show you a graph. So in your D3 learning curve, right, you've, you've already covered most of it, right, I mean the basics. If you can build a moving scale, I think, then you can sort of build any visualization in D3, right. What do I move by, mean by moving scale is this. So if you see, not only the bars change, but even the labels, right? Is that, it's not, is that visible? Can you see the, I mean, it keeps changing, it's random max, but if you see the last row, it's going from integer to decimal, and you know, the number of ticks are increasing, number of, um, sometimes, so, so it's actually pretty interesting, right? So one is your values are changing, right? If your values are changing, then you want to recalibrate your scale, right? Because you want everything to fit. So, right, so the bars, we've already seen how do you transform the bars, that's pretty easy, right? This part is pretty interesting that how the axes are changing, the scale. So the way they've done it is that you, you maintain two sets of scales, the old scale and the new scale, right? So you have like, scale x old, scale x y, uh, scale x new, right? You get the new data, you plot the new data with the old scale, okay? So your data would, let's say it's off the start, right? So it would be here. Now you tween it to the new position with the new scale. So what would happen is, you would see that the data that was here sort of come in like this smoothly inside, right? And you know, it took me a long time to figure out exactly how this was working, but this is what it's doing. So if you see, you know, values go in and out very seamlessly, right? And that's all that there is. You need to just remember that there is an old x and the new, uh, and a new x uh, scale. You plot the values on the old one, and then you tween them to the new one, right? And that's it. Then it sort of takes care of the rest. So if you can build this on your own, then sort of you understood everything there is to D3 and in terms of the philosophy behind it, right? the rest of it is API. The more functions you use, the more interesting your data is, the more sexy your graphs you can build. Right? Um, yeah. Maybe we can pull up the code for this one and see this. So D3 also has. Is this font size? Okay, so you didn't check in the reading. Is it there? So D3 has these really cool functions called, you know, .json, .csv, which make it really easy to read um, data from a file. <coughs> so actually, first let's just go ahead and look at the data. So this is your data has got 
you know, ranges, measures, and markers, right? So, for, so there are five series. You know, the first one called revenue, profit, and so on, right? And each of those series have three sort of data sets. One is ranges, the other is measures, and the final thing is markers, right? <coughs> and if you go back and you see the graph on top, you will see that there are there is one, uh, two, and three. But basically, there are these three um, bars. There's this dark, there's this light blue, then there's gray, and these these sets, right? So they are also there. And then you have this final line marker. Yeah, sorry, now I remember. So there's dark blue and light blue are, you know, one data set, right? Your dark grays in the background is one data set, and then finally you have that marker value which is floating over here, right? So he's plotted all three data sets in this one bullet graph, right? And does that make sense? Just so that you understand again. So there are ranges, this is 1500, 255, I think these are the grays, right? Measures are the blues because there are only two values. And then finally marker is that one value that floats right at the end, right? So in this one graph, you can, you can get sort of, um, you can show a lot of data. Right, you can compare what does the split look like from this year, you know, this year if you have two quantities, compare it to what it, would, what it looked like last year. And then you could say what your targets are, so it could be, you know, um, a graph which is showing you all this data in one go. Anyway, coming back to this, so he gets this JSON data, right. Uh, okay, the complicated part that he's done in this is that he is, um, in, you know, in this particular graph, what he's done is he is he's combined all of this. He's he's looked at so like how we were working with data, right? Array, where one, two, three, four, right? For him, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four, this is five. That is, each one is one element for him. Then he takes that one element and then he plots that data. So it's got a little bit of recursive curves to it. Um, but you know, I'll try and sort of skip that part. Anyway, so here you can see that he's maintaining the scales. Right? If you can see this x1, right? x1 is getting, it's the new scale, right? So it's passing the new data, it's building a scale. Right? Forget about, just focus on x1 is equal to d3 dot scale linear, right? Just this part. And he's supplying the data to this and he's getting that. Whereas xo, he's saying this is the previous scale, you know, he's storing this in this old um, chart, under, underscore, underscore, chart, underscore, underscore variable, or he's creating it. So the first time you don't have a old scale, right? So the first time it won't translate. First time it will just be, you know, both the scales will be the same. But the next time around, right, you would have the difference in the two scales. So when they update, they would change. So here, that's where he sort of, he starts the new scale right here. Um, yeah. Um, the other interesting things that B3 has is <coughs> so the other thing that B3 has, which um, which is pretty cool, is layouts. So this is a stacked layout, okay? What this does is, so each one, if you see over here, is a path, right? This is a path, which is basically an area. So it's, you you know, you're specifying all the boundaries and then you fill up that path. So each one is a shape, right? But, actually, let's go look at the data. Uh, does this have data? Okay. But if you look at the data, right, so they will all be, I mean, in Excel, have you done those stacked bar graphs? You've done stacked bar graphs, right? Where you have different quantities, but you pile them up onto each other. The data set behind this is also similar, right? But the difference is that once you run it through this layout, stacked layout, it modifies the data in such a way that 
you know, it basically becomes a stacked data set. So that, and when, when you pass it, when you pass it through this area function, right, um, and uh, SVG d three dot area or whatever, and you would get such a visualization. So you have, um, you know, you have one curve, and then the next curve would go over that, and then the third curve would go over that, and things like that. So d three does all that heavy lifting for you, right? So um, this is there in you know layouts. There are different layouts. So suppose uh, there's stack. Um, there are a whole, whole lot more of them. The, yeah, so there's, there are all these layouts, bundle, chord, cluster, course, hierarchy, histogram, pack. I think you had done a pack visualization last time, right? Partition, pie. This is your, uh, you know, to get donut charts and pie charts, etc. Stack. I mean, what they're doing is basically they're modifying the data, right? And um, there's a, another interesting one called Sankey, uh, which is a plugin which gets uh, which I just recently explored. So you know, I wanted to show. So you know, we're building an enterprise product, and an application goes through various teams, right? And then at some stage, it gets rejected and goes backwards, right? And if you're a good organization, you want it to flow forwards only, never backwards. So we wanted to show what percentage of them are going back and things like that. So the Sankey plot does it really well. You specify each of your nodes, you know, they're the teams, so they, it draws rectangles for them, right? And um, it actually looks ugly, but you can just try and show it at the moment. need to work on this, make it slightly prettier, but clearly you can see I budgeted from someone else's example. But basically these were the way, you know, and I can also show you our data. So, you know, this particular graph expects the data in this format where you have nodes. Nodes are, in my case, all these teams. So this is the financial workflow. So you know this is showing you all the various teams, and then it expects something like this link. So between index two and three, that is application and sanction, right? And the value is 21, right? So then Sankey takes this and then sort of plots it this way. Where over here, you know what you were looking at, this was 21 applications that are going forward this way, and it also has certain you know, animation built into it or you know, interactivity where I can pull back and forth. So this graph, I mean, needs to be beautified and things like that. But the cool part is that you can see these little uh, you know, threads which are saying, hey, you're going backwards. Okay? So there's one application which is going backwards, here, six. And you know, you can also see where are people going from, you know, somewhere to, you know, from where are they jumping directly to the exact stage, right? So, I mean, um, the way sort of I, at least I use D3 is I, you know, find interesting examples and then try and see if my data looks good in this or not, does it come through because, you know, not everyone can sort of understand what's going on over here and you keep iterating with it and then you sort of figure out. Um, there's another visualization that I've tried which, which is the same data I tried to plot it this way trying to see what, does it convey anything different. But this really didn't make much sense. This was the Euro debt uh, example, right? So once you sort of figure out your visualization, then you start tweaking it, and then you start, you know, making it work for your needs, your specific needs. Sometimes you're just sort of exploring and seeing, does this, does my data look good in this or not, right? And then you know the basic concepts of enter, exit, and update always remain the same. So. Approaching, uh, approaching a problem and then figuring out 
context to how to uh, plot the data against a particular group? How to plot the data against a particular layout or I mean how do I visualize the end result that uh, I'm going to use this layout and this data will go with this layout? Sure. No, that's a valid question and my only answer is trial and error. Um, so I think, so if you go to a D3, you know, gallery, you have a huge number of options and there are equal number of sort of, you know, community options, right? But not everything is relevant. Um, I think, you know, you start off over here, right, by looking at what you're trying to plot. Is it location based or is it, you know, um, are you looking at some, you know, sort of, uh, a network diagram, right? Or is it a time series data set? Right? So time series would you would look something like this. There is there's another really cool example called cross filter which we will try to sort of understand how it works. Um, you know, this this is a company called Square that has built this. So by the way, we haven't covered, we haven't looked at even some of the advanced API. There's something called as context brushes, etc., where you can like focus and zoom in on a particular part of your chart. So I would say start here. Just look at you know some of these visualizations, and then see whether your data makes sense or not. So like this is you know data about flights, you know their arrival and departure times, whether they were ahead of time, behind time, you know time of day when did they leave, and all of that. Right. So if you see this, I'm changing the. So if you look at this, this is actually pretty interesting. This number, fifty-three thousand eight one seven of two lakh odd, you know. So and this is all happening really quickly. So if I move this, if my screen is small, right. this is all possible. So and the and D3 uses and it has something called as brushes, you know, uh, context brush. Basically, D3, I mean, start here, this will give you a good place and um, then tweak and work backwards into making it work for yourself. And, but definitely look at this resource in terms of, uh, you know, reusable charts. Um, once you start to get a handle on things, then you would, you know, start wanting to reuse the same components. And especially if you're using some MVC framework, you know, like Backbone, Ember, Angular or anything like that, then you would want to keep using them, you know, here and there. Yeah, I mean, the way your charts were drawn was with pretty granular control, but mm -hmm. most of the other APIs and all, it's not that granular, like, right. and whether so you need this much of granularity for a day-to-day -day work. Also. Right, that's also, I mean, so that, that's that's a question that you're going to answer, yeah. Um, yeah, so sometimes, yeah, absolutely, that's true. I mean, you have to take that call and then sort of decide if you want to do things with D3, and the other thing is you don't, you know, I mean, you could also use D3 in a different way. You don't need to necessarily draw, you know, charts with it. You could pass in any kind of data and it could answer this thing about, is this new data, this is updated data, or this is exited, you know. And you could use that to do a whole lot of other things. I mean, I mean, but specifically in the browser you could, so you could arrange, um, maybe you got a, you know, a WebSocket feed of tweets and how you want to reorder them on your uh, browser, you could use that, you could use D3 in there. Right. So you don't have to draw SVG elements, you could use this with divs and other uh, DOM But there are also APIs built on top of this, right? So Vega, for example, if you want to use reusable, there are other libraries like Vega, which builds on D3, which use standard components. Uh, it's from Trifecta. So I think those are, again, things you can Try out. And in terms of choosing graphs, I mean, I think you can go and read some of Stephen few books or some of the other books will basically will tell you what to do with different types of things. That's probably also a good story. What are the data handling capabilities like how much data can you um, I wouldn't be able to comment directly, but you know, the, the the thing that I was just discussing, it had two lakh rows of data. Mm -hmm. right? In browser, in real time, you were sort of filtering that. So 
that's pretty powerful. That's really efficient. Um, it has. So, and it can read data in these formats, right? including external resources. So you have, you could send it XML, CSV, tab separated files, JSON, text, and all of that. So it's pretty powerful and really efficient. Any other questions? Exporting mechanisms we have once you have these visualizations. What do you mean by export? Like print yeah. PDF or something like that? Yeah, I mean, to give it to the next level of business management, you want to export it in a nice graph or whichever the way. Like and linking those to, to the PPT or PowerPoint presentation. So, I mean, this is a web page, right? So, you could take a print screen. <laughs> in, um, and, I mean, so, I mean, uh, on a different note, I mean, so, I mean, Basically, uh, you could make this into a PDF, like, you know, Chrome allows you to do it. I mean, uh, this, is not, this is not specific to D3. Right? This is anything in browser, you could, whatever you, however you can export from browser, those same rules will apply. But there was a pretty interesting story almost a year ago or something. Uh, there was this company, another analytics company, I'm forgetting the name, right? They had... Maybe it was chart or uh, not chart or I'm forgetting. But basically, they had built this whole dashboard, right? And um, on the web. So if you log in, you could see your website, you could see all these cool stats in a really cool way. But they wanted to give the same sort of visualizations on email. So you get an update you know, every day or every week, whatever you do. And their big challenge was that this is D3, right? It's JavaScript driven, right? And it can't be served in an email get uh, blocked. So what they did was they uh, used PhantomJS. PhantomJS is like a headless browser. Right? So they, they had a job which would run, wake up, run and then run it in a headless, in, in a PhantomJS loop, take a sprint screen, attach it to the email and then send it out. Right? So that was really cool because they reused all their code etc which they had built for the web for email so they didn't you know, create a separate thing. And the user experience was the same because that's how my graph looks like on the web. Also looks like that in my email. But there is so no way to retain the interactivity. There is no way to retain it. No. It's not flash. It's, uh, um, so, yeah. there is no way to export also. That means, oh, except this is a very roundabout way. Yeah, this is a roundabout way. So, exporting, <coughs> so you could make it a PDF and print screen and things like that. Right? But, I mean, no, I mean, I don't think, I don't, I, I can't imagine. Uh, there are a few uh, ways that are emerging uh, okay. in terms of uh, export options. So, in New York Times, for instance, uh, Shan Carter, I think, has released a, a browser uh, a bookmarklet called SVG Chroma, which is, uh, what it does is extract the SVG or the engagement saves, which is one step to the solution. There are enough ways of converting that SVG into other somewhat granular formats. So you can load it, for instance, in Inkscape uh, and save it as a Perl draw file if it needs to go into a version. Or save it as an EMF and then import the EMF into Word or PowerPoint and so on. So those are semi-automated ways uh, in the sense that you could automate Inkscape to do this transfer and so on. We've recently built something that converts SVG into Microsoft Office native objects, for example. There are a few other examples of uh, PDF output, like somebody mentioned, using Phantom JS from the directory. Uh, so these are at their infancy, but while D3 doesn't directly provide the support, I guess it's more a question of can SVG be exported to other formats? The answer is increasingly but slowly yes. I, mean, I didn't know about any of those, so that's really cool. Uh, but just a separate thing, like you can also run these, so we use these visualizations on a mobile as well. Uh, product spans across mobile and you know the web. So this is the same sort of visualization that would run on the web that runs over here. Um, and you know you have the same sort of. So I mean for us it's very nice because you are reusing components. We try to build the same thing in Java and Android. We had a real tough time. I just want to reiterate that uh, you can just copy the SVG DOM uh, element and save it to any file and save the extension as .svg and you can open it in Adobe Illustrator or 
in state as Anta had mentioned. And also there's another library called NVD3. It gives you a lot of reusable graphs uh, which are similar to your Google visualization charts. NVD3, is it? NVD3. This one? Yeah. And you can also do the same kind of customization. Also, it's a good example for how you can uh, uh, extend the D3 library as and make reusable charts by yourself. Yeah. That's really cool. What type of fallback we can provide if browser doesn't support SVG? Mm. I, I, I can't answer that question. I mean, so either images, either you store them as images, or I mean, increasingly, I, mean, I don't know which browsers, but I think IE 7, 8, maybe they're the only gaps. I don't know. Even I9 does not support SVGs. SVGs. So yeah. you use scan assist, something called Blackberry or Yeah, sorry, I was I was really stuck with SVG part of it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I9 actually supports some amount of SVG. Uh, no, they natively. Uh, thank heavens for that because that's <laughs> got us a few crores of revenue just that one feature. Um, and it's not too bad either in terms of support. But yeah, 6, 7 and 8 are one reason why we'll have trouble with SVG and the other are uh, browsers that just do not render uh, images. But in that case, I guess the visualization point is more. I use 6, 7, 8, uh, canvas wouldn't work either. The only realistic options are images, like you said, or VML. And there is an SVG to VML uh, converter, which sort of works on the fly. There's a whole bunch of them. There used to be one that Google used to support. Which is uh, or was a fairly robust one. Um, I don't know if it continues to be supported, but without doubt, this would be the cleanest way to render uh, SVG on older browsers. Images <coughs> are a workable world. Now, VML as such is a pretty good standard in the sense that it's, it supports many of the features that SVG does. So, which means that it's possible to use the interactivity that one gets with SVG with VML as well in some of the older browsers, but that obviously is a standard that is fading away. Yeah. I mean, what we do is not sustainable. We don't support I. I mean, <laughs> I mean we're a small startup team, so we've just sort of tried to re you know reuse our code and resources in you know in one place. So we say we don't support I and things like that. So, but that's not the right approach. But that works for us for now. I think Gingerbread also doesn't support uh, SVG. Yeah, SVGs are not supported below. 2.3 yeah. or maybe 3 even. But now you have a Samsung Galaxy Star Phone 4.9 and K, which is 4.1, I think. That be. So, I mean, these are all sort of, uh, you know, it's all touch and go in the sense that, you know, you're moving forward, things are changing. <coughs> if you really have to support, if you have a client which is, you know, on legacy systems, then I think you should do that. But if you don't have such constraints, I don't think you should try and support the entire ecosystem. I mean, that's my personal opinion, given resources and things like that. So I just want a quick point for me. Was this sort of uh, format useful? I mean, or was it too basic and too much time spent just trying to make an Ember app work? And we do have a feedback from that we distribute. We get yeah, so I, I would love to know because you know, just tried a new approach and just trying to see if that works. Cool, thank you so much and sorry for the delay in starting. <laughs>